we'll see states around the country step up to provide additional support uh, to women uh, that are facing crisis pregnancies. I've also been a great champion of adoption reform in America. I think to be pro-life, you need to be pro-adoption. Mike Pence's suggestion that adoption might ease some of the burdens women face if abortion rights disappear. Seriously? reflects a new political reality right there. Republicans are now under pressure to reconsider their approach on family and medical assistance. As The Washington Post points out, the GOP has adamantly opposed President Biden's proposals to provide cash payments for parents, universal pre-kindergarten, and other family benefit programs, such as expanded child care subsidies. So let's discuss. With us tonight, journalist Jessica Bruder. She wrote the New York Times best-selling book, Nomadland, and Dr. Kavita Patel, clinical physician and former senior policy director during the Obama administration. She's also one of our public health experts here at NBC. Kavita, if we see these restrictive laws, they're not going to affect wealthy women. Wealthy women can hop on a plane and go to another state for abortion services. You have seen firsthand what happens when states restrict care what happens to more economically vulnerable women? Explain. Yeah, so economically vulnerable women, and honestly, Steph, it's really a wide array of women, even educated women, find themselves, because of access issues, not knowing who and when to see, find themselves with unplanned pregnancies. And in 14 states right now, we have such restrictive abortion policies that you can imagine, this isn't a future scenario, it's a now scenario. They face higher maternity mortality, they face unintended pregnancy outcomes. Think about how much, when we, we have a pregnancy, how much we rely on having a healthy emotional and physical surrounding. If you're economically vulnerable, that is less likely. Many women are often found left to stay in abusive relationships. So there's higher rates of spouse and partner abuse. And then many are also in households with other children. So this is a spillover effect. We've seen that studies done, a five-year study called the Turnaway Study at UCSF, that looked at women who had been turned away from abortions because of gestational age, that there had been long lasting effects in those unplanned pregnancy in the children, developmental disorders, mental health disorders. So this is a far ripple effect, economically vulnerable, but I would say all women have had some element of this. And what we see is that they don't have any Jessica, you wrote in The Atlantic last month that a post-Roe world will not resemble a pre-Roe world. What do you mean by that? I mean, we've got two things that didn't exist back then. We've got the Internet and we also have abortion pills. Uh, science has come a long way. While we are going to have a lot of people facing incredible challenges, just look at what happened after Texas passed SB8. There was an abortion diaspora, bottlenecks in neighboring states, uh, more Texas patients in Washington state, in Maryland, everywhere. Uh, Texas has one in 10 women of reproductive age in the U.S., but imagine this times, you know, maybe 26 states. So it's going to be a huge challenge, but it's not going to be the same challenge that my parents uh, and my forebears faced because we have better information. And I think part of it right now is just among activists, a fight to get the information out there to tell people about the resources that exist from websites, including plancpills.org, which have information about getting pills to the Repro Legal Helpline, which helps people protect themselves for self-managed abortion, to the MNA hotline for miscarriages and abortions. So the resources to help people are out there, and the internet is out there to help spread the word. Dr. Patel, I want to share what we heard from a North Dakota clinic worker today. It definitely makes things real. I mean, it's been a surreal uh, couple of days. Um, it took me about 20 seconds after getting the news to vomit. Um, and yeah, providers are not okay. How are medical workers handling this idea? Oh, Steph, I mean, I have tears. You know, every time someone else is talking, I think about the youngest patient I've ever seen in this situation, a 14-year-old teen who was brought in by her parents and was desperate, father who was very concerned about her health and she had hidden the pregnancy from them. And there were so many issues around that. 
And I think now about how hard it would be for that brave girl to come forward, even with internet access or even with many resources stuff, I wouldn't have been able to do anything. Even then it was hard. Now it would be impossible. So that is, we are all feeling it. In fact, the most common text thread we all have is what is, what is it that we can do? Do we need to export providers? Do we need to put up more resources, donate more money? But it does feel like it's just another slap in the face to say, you know, your health care is not between you and your doctor. It's now up for Supreme Court, for courts, legislatures to decide. Well, if they do this, does the government need to provide more money to support these women carrying pregnancies to term or put an actual financial obligation on the fathers? Jessica? Yeah. It, it's, it, it's funny. I, I think the government... We need to not go where we're going, first of all. But yes, we do, we do need more of a social safety net in this country. We've known this for a long time. We are some of the leaders in the so-called developed world when it comes to economic inequality, along with maternal mortality. Um, lots of things that are coming into play right now. So yes, I do think we need more equitable responsibility and more support for people, uh, people of every gender when it comes to having kids. But we also need support for people to have that full slate of options, whether it's the freedom to have children in a healthy environment or the freedom to not have children. Uh, this is part of the reprodu reproductive justice framework, and I think I'm, I'm glad people are talking about it. Government is looking to put more rules, restrictions, and responsibilities on women. Women can't get pregnant without men. What are they going to do about the men?